starting. And once again, let me welcome everybody officially to Sexual Victimization in Prison, Moving Toward Elimination. Today's event is sponsored by the National Institute of Justice and the Government Innovators Network. And without uh, any further delay, let me pass things off to today's moderator, Ashbel T. or A.T. Wall, Director of the Rhode Island Department of Corrections. Mr. Wall. Thank you very much, Jim. As Jim has said, my name is A.T. Wall. I am a career correctional professional. I haven't gotten my start in a line position about 31 years ago, and I'm now proud to be in entering my ninth year as director of the Rhode Island Department of Corrections. And with me are three experts who I would like to introduce, and then I'll make a few remarks before I ask them to present their slides. We have a great group of panelists here, and I'll start with Alan Beck. Uh, I believe that Alan's biography uh, is available to you right. on, the, on your screens. I'll simply highlight that he is the uh, Principal Deputy Director at the United States uh, Justice Department's Bureau of Justice Statistics and is responsible for all its statistical collection and analysis. Uh, he is specifically the point person on the implementation of the requirement in the Prison Rape Elimination Act that there be a comprehensive statistical study of the incidence of sexual abuse in custodial settings uh, and that those findings be reported to Congress. Uh, second, uh, we have with us Brenda Smith. And Brenda is a professor of law at American University's Washington College of Law and an expert on issues affecting women in prisons, uh, including in particular sexual abuse. She has been a litigator in this area and also has done extensive teaching and research on the subject. In recognition of her expertise and background, uh, she was appointed by the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, to be a representative to the National Prison Rape Elimination Commission, a body established in the PREA Act to promulgate standards for the profession. Finally, uh, Barbara Owen formerly a senior researcher with the Federal Bureau of Prisons and currently a professor at uh, California State Fresno in criminology. Barbara is also a widely published scholar and author uh, and teacher uh, on a variety of topics related to women in institutional corrections, the dynamics of female institutions, gender-specific program, programming, and also staff sexual misconduct. And yeah, shortly, I, I, I'll ask... Shortly, I'll ask each of them to, uh, to present a limited number of slides uh, to kick off the discussion while we invite you to begin to submit questions so that we can tap this panel's expertise. Let me start by saying that uh, we in the profession know that sexual abuse, both staff on inmate and inmate on inmate, have occurred as long as there have been jails and prisons but that the passage of the Prison Rape Elimination Act uh, has shown a spotlight on an issue that has remained in the shadows for many, many years. Uh, as it happens, uh, I was tapped by the Professional Association of the State Corrections Directors uh, to testify at the co congressional hearings on this bill as it was making its way through Congress. And I can tell you that it passed both houses, the Senate and the House of Representatives, unanimously without a single dissent and was signed into law in September of 2003 by the President. So it enjoyed a great deal of support across the entire spectrum of politics. What does PREA do? It makes the prevention, uh, investigation, and punishment of prison rape, both inmate on inmate and staff sexual misconduct, a priority for the nation's jails and prisons. It includes mandates for data collection, uh, the requirement that uh, training and technical assistance be offered to the profession, and the establishment of a commission who, which will promulgate standards that will serve as the template uh, for the entire profession 
in addressing this challenge. It is, I believe, a challenge that our profession is ready, willing, and able to accept. And this conference is intended to help us all learn more about what we can and need to do to be successful in our mission. With that having been said, I'd like to open it up to Alan Beck so that, uh, Alan, you can present the information that you have that provides some statistical context for our discussion, after which I'll ask Brenda to speak from her perspective, and then Barbara. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Let me begin by saying that the Prison Rape Elimination Act is not about prisons and it's not about rape. It is about all forms of uh, correctional supervision, uh, holding people in custody, whether it be prisons or jails or juvenile facilities, police lockups. It includes a vast number of facilities beyond simply prisons. The Bureau of Justice Statistics estimate that about 9,000 facilities are covered under the Act. Let me say it also applies much more broadly to all forms of sexual violence, not simply rape, and that means a, a substantial continuum uh, uh, in terms of the types of activities included. Uh, it would include any forms of sexual activity that are unwanted or illegal within a correctional setting, including all forms of staff sexual misconduct, however initiated. The Prison Rape Elimination Act requires BJS fundamentally to pr provide estimates of the incidence and prevalence of sexual violence at a facility level. It goes well beyond simply mandating a national study. It requires BJS to provide accurate and comparable estimates of sexual violence for every facility included in the study. It requires BJS to rank these facilities every year through 2010. It requires BJS to sample not fewer than 10% of all facilities each and every year. And finally, it requires BJS to interview current and former inmates. So there is a very uh, substantial mandate to fill. Let me begin by saying that to meet these requirements, BJS has adopted a multi-measure, multi-mode strategy. Specifically, we assessed the past research and deemed it de deficient and not suited for ranking facilities. Past research was subject to very low response rates. Past research did not have uniform definitions. And, it wasn't, and the past research was beset by the absence of scientific sampling and adjustment for, for response and non-response bias. As we developed the methodology, we uh, began our work using administrative records. And so in 2004, following the passage of the Act, BJS undertook a large-scale national survey of administrative, uh, based on administrative records. We included all state prison systems, the federal system. We sampled local jails. We included all juvenile systems. And we sampled local and privately operated juvenile uh, facilities. Based on those administrative records, we issued a report and we have issued three reports available on the BJS website at ojp.usdoj.gov slash BJS entitled Sexual Violence Reported by Correctional Authorities for each of those three years, 2004, 2005, 2006. While we were doing those record surveys, we developed a methodology for collecting data from inmates whether current or former inmates. That methodology, and its shorthand, is a CASI audio computer assisted self-interviewing, which essentially means that the interview is conducted on a kiosk or a soft screen uh, computer with a synchronized audio feed. That methodology has been shown to uh, be uh, advantageous for collecting data that's fairly sensitive in nature in which a personal interview is, will not draw out uh, the full array of information one is looking for. So we spent that time developing a Kathy self-interview. And in 2007, we began national implementation. So today I'm here to 
share with you some of the results from our first national implementation. I think we began data collection in April of 2007 in 150 state and federal prisons housing adult offenders. At the same time, we sampled local jails, about 300 such local jails, and we'll be coming out with the results from those sampled local jails in April of this year. Let me say that the, uh, the survey did quite well. We had substantially high response rates, almost twice the response rates that have been found in the previous literature. 72% was a very good response rate given the sensitivities of these questions. We interviewed over 23,000 inmates and asked them about their experience since coming to the facility or in the past 12 months, whichever was shorter. We conducted some of the interviews in Spanish, about 5%, and some of the interviews with paper and pencil, primarily for inmates who could not be brought out of segregation for, or they were too violent to uh, interact one-on-one -on -one through the survey instrumentation. The survey itself provides the first ever national prevalence estimates on sexual violence in prisons. And what we learned in that survey was that we found an estimate of about 4.5%. That is, 4.5% of those 23,000 inmates who were interviewed reported one or more incidents of sexual victimization in the period of time in the last 12 months or since arriving at the facility, whichever was shorter. We learned that not all uh, that 4.5% was of the same sort. That is, there was a range of incidents from the least serious, that is, unwanted touching, grabbing, and groping, if you wish, to the most serious that typically is considered forcible rape or sodomy. We learned that about half of the incidents involved other inmates, that is, involved unwanted sexual activity between inmates, and about half of that activity involved some form of staff sexual misconduct, whether characterized as willing or unwilling. We, in terms of ranking facilities, we were able to identify 10 facilities with the highest rates. Although the Congress envisioned BJS to rank facilities from 1 to 150, statistically this was not possible, given that we were sampling facilities and each sample estimate would necessarily have a standard error, a margin of error. There are times when we cannot statistically distinguish the rate observed in one facility from the rate observed in another facility. However, we were able to identify 10 facilities that were statistically similar, all 10 being high. That is, they had a rate, a prevalence rate, for that period of exposure of 9.3% or greater. Five of the 10 facilities were in the state of Texas. One facility was in Florida, one was in New York, one was in Nebraska, one was in Indiana, one was in California. Each of these estimates, again, had a margin of error. The highest facility, the facility with the highest rate was in Estelle, the Estelle unit in Texas, with a rate of 15.7%. That means that 15.7% of the persons we interviewed in that facility, we interviewed 197, reported to us some incidents of unwanted sexual activity that is, they reported some form of sexual victimization as we defined it. The margin of error around that is approximately 5.1%. That is, 1.96 in statistical terms times the standard error of 2.6. So what that means is that we know that the actual rate in the Estelle unit would be somewhere between 5. Uh, 2, uh, 1 percent and uh, 20 uh, point some percent. We found that the uh, six facilities 
reported no incidents. That is, inmates in those facilities that we interviewed reported nothing occurring. We also found that in 36 facilities, in 36 facilities, the prevalence rates were not distinguishable from zero. So we had at least a quarter of the facilities in which the rates were not statistically different from zero. This is very good news. We also learned that the prevalence rates differed by type of sexual victimization. At each of these high units, if you will, attained these rates in different ways. We found three facilities that were female facilities among the top ten, a very high rate among female facilities, and that these female facilities were largely the result of reported inmate-on-inmate -inmate sexual activity rather than staff. Among male facilities, among those other facilities, the driving force behind those prevalence rates seemed to be staff sexual misconduct. Let me also say that we found uh, that physical force and pressure and physical injury were relatively uncommon. That is, overall, nationwide, about 1% of our inmates reported that there was physical force involving that inmate on inmate sexual assault. About 1.7% reported some pressure, that is, that were, they were not physically forced, but felt pressured, felt they had to have that sexual activity. And we found that about half of 1% of all inmates interviewed reported some form of injury. Finally, we learned about staff sexual misconduct. We and care when interpreting these high levels of staff sexual misconduct. Specifically, we find that about half of that staff sexual misconduct is reported as unwilling, and half of that staff sexual misconduct is willing. The complexity is to understand what willing means in the, in the, in the context of an institution where individuals, although they may initiate, cannot consent. Legally, all forms of staff sexual misconduct are, is, are illegal. We learned that though that staff sexual misconduct involved about 2.9% of the, of the inmates we interviewed, only three-tenths of 1% reported some form of injury. We learned further that we need to explore the nature of willing sexual activity and unwilling sexual activity between staff members. There's con great concern that inmates have about pat downs and strip searches. Inmates express unhappiness with such activity, and it may well be that unhappiness that is ex being expressed in, in, in these reports of staff sexual conduct. So in the, in the coming year, we'll be conducting this survey again, and we're going to be including questions that link these reports to the incidents and prevalence of pat-downs and strip searches within institutions. We're going to be measuring the institutional climate to better understand the relationship between staff and inmates insofar as tensions that exist between staff and inmates may be get, get expressed in these, in these uh, reports that we have. So we will be sampling in 2008, we'll be in 160 facilities in 2008, and we'll begin that survey once again in August, in late August and early September. Uh, Dr. Beck, this is uh, Jim Cooney. Um, just a, a technical question for you. Um, it sounds like some people are having a little bit of difficulty hearing you in particular. Oh. Are you uh, speaking on a, a speakerphone? Yeah, I can take, I can take it off. <laughs> yeah, that might help. Uh, thanks for that. And, and, and while I'm on, I'll also just say that uh, a lot of people were asking at the very beginning you gave a website. Yes. And uh, if you could offer that website again before you conclude, that would be helpful. That's fine. Our website here at BJS is OJP, OJP dot USDOJ dot gov slash BJS. Uh, Alan, it's AT. There's such a rich amount of information that you have here. 
I'm hoping that people will look at the slides and come up with questions for you that might be in response to the slides. Before we move on to Brenda, I just wanted to ask you a, a question, which is really sort of the take-home question. You have a plethora of information here. You've learned a lot about this issue. For those of us out in the field, what's the take-home? Well, the take-home is, is that we are observing uh, much higher rates of sexual violence than previously reported by correctional authorities. Uh, in our in our uh, in our administrative records research, we found perhaps about one tenth of these allegations. Uh, but the rates are substantially lower than what was contained in the act. Let me also say the take home here is is that what we're dealing with is allegations, and a survey can never reach the level of of a confirmed incident. Can never match that. That a that a, a true investigation can provide, and so what we have is a window uh, on what goes on. But we know that some of these incidents may be false positives. That is, some may not have actually occurred, and up uh, and we also know that some incidents may still not be reported, despite our best efforts to encourage inmates to come forward. There may be some who still are reluctant to come forward. It's an interesting summary because, of course, the, the goal of the mandate was to try to get a, a handle on just what the incidence is. I think what we're seeing is that this is the most comprehensive study ever conducted, but it ultimately is not going to be able to settle uh, every question. I imagine, speaking of questions, that others are going to have some for you, Alan, and again, I would invite uh, people to continue, as some of you have already begun to do, to submit your questions so that we can identify those that we think would be of general interest and pitch them back to our three experts. And with that, I'd like to turn to Professor Smith and uh, ask you, Professor, if you would please go through some of your slides, uh, recognizing that uh, we'll also have an opportunity to ask you to elaborate at a later point. You bring a particular perspective as one of the commissioners, one of the nine commissioners on the Prison Rape Elimination Commission. Please feel free to uh, speak Pop to in us. at this point. Sure. Thanks, AP. Uh, first of all, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to go very quickly because even though I can't see it, it, it I, I know that we have a full house, and I'm sure that people have lots of questions. And one of the things that's really been helpful here is that Alan and uh, AP have actually covered some of the things that I want to uh, talk about, all right? So um, I'm just going to my slide on the uh, overview of PREA. Um, you know, as AT said, uh, PREA passed unanimously in 2003. I think one of the things that it's important uh, to talk about with regard to PREA is not only sort of the overwhelming support from um, um, both houses of Congress, but also the coming together of many groups who were interested in this issue. Certainly uh, advocacy organizations, but also a real interest uh, from the faith-based um, community uh, as well, uh, and also those who uh, were concerned in general about victimization uh, as well. So I think that that's also a very important thing to uh, talk about. Even though I have on the slide uh, that this covers all custodial settings, and I actually mentioned military there. Military isn't mentioned in the Act. And when I start talking about what's going on with the Commission, uh, I want to be clear that that's not an area that we're going to delve into. Um, Alan has talked about some of the work that he's done specific that BJS is doing. But one of the things that's also very important uh, and that the Act did is it kind of gave everybody uh, that's on this list particular jobs. Many of you are familiar with the National Institute of Corrections, and under the Act, uh, the National Institute of Corrections, NIC, was charged with uh, doing technical assistance and training and really sort of sounding the alarm out in the field about Prius here and what do you need to be doing in order to comply or begin complying. Um, then, of course, there's a tremendous amount of research going on uh, with the National Institute of Justice, and the National Institute of Justice uh, was uh, very 
gracious in helping to put together this web chat. Uh, the Bureau of Justice Assistance provided grants, um, and I believe that the, uh, the Act initially authorized between 40 and $60 million for grants. Not that all of that money was appropriated, but a significant number of grants have gone out. And in looking at the attendance list, I see a number of uh, jurisdictions on um, this chat who I know received those grants. Uh, the Bureau of Prisons I mentioned, uh, because once the standards are promulgated, they will be immediately applicable to Bureau of Prisons facilities. Um, there is also uh, an institutional review panel, and I hope that we get questions back about that, because what that institutional review panel does is it takes the information that Alan talked about, and one of the provisions under the Act is that those people with those highest and lowest numbers have to appear before the review panel and explain to them what happened. How did we get to be the highest and how did we get to be the lowest? Uh, and then certainly there's the National Prison Rape Elimination uh, Commission. Uh, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about things that you should know. Um, a couple of things that you should know about the Prison Rape Elimination Act, and I think that this was a huge concern um, for people when the act was initially passed. Um, you know, as a correctional administrator, as a state, does this mean that this is another source of legal rights for prisoners? And actually, the answer to that is no. The um, Prison Rape Elimination Act specifically says that it does not create any private right of action, any new legal rights. It says that it aims at protecting the already existing Eighth Amendment rights of prisoners. The Eighth Amendment uh, prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. So, um, and that's probably one of the reasons why the Act passed unanimously, because there wasn't any creation of new rights. Um, one of the things that the Act does is it does have a little bit of a stick. And so if after the standards are passed, you fail to comply with them, there is the prospect of a loss of funding. And I think finally, while the underlying requirements don't create new rights, they could provide very useful information in gaining visibility for the issue of sexual violence in a particular jurisdiction or a particular institution. Uh, and that uh, visibility could come from contact with the media, the legislature, or certainly through litigation. Um, now, uh, AT mentioned that there were nine members of the commission. There actually were nine. We're down one, so we're eight. Um, we're all political appointee, appointees. At this point, uh, there are four um, four members who were appointed uh, by Republicans and four who were appointed by Democrats. I think one of the things that is important to say is that we work extremely collaboratively. Uh, we have educated each other over the three or four years, I guess four years that we have uh, been uh, in existence. Uh, and our main task is to produce a report that talks about um, you know, sort of the state of sexual violence in institutional settings. While Alan has come up with lots of the numbers and what we can find to some degree quantitatively, our work is going to rely on that, but it's also going to look at qualitative information. Um, and, you know, we're going to address a number of those hard issues, both in the report uh, and in the standards. So issues around uh, supervision. Uh, cross-gender supervision, for example, um, issues around consent or false allegations or whatever, because I know that those are issues that come up. Uh, but those issues are going to be addressed uh, either in the report, probably, or in the standards. Uh, one of the things that many people ask is, okay, so you guys have been in existence since you know November of 2003 when the Act passed. You know, when are we going to see something? When are we going to have something to work with? Um, there will be draft standards out for public comment in April of this year. So in two months, there will be standards out on the street uh, for public comment. And we're looking to get comment from people about um, 
asking questions, saying whether uh, this is a good thing, whether this is a bad thing, and of course we're going to consider all of that. Uh, we've worked very extensively with the field in putting those standards together. And in fact, one of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a readiness assessment with 10 jurisdictions. So picking 10 jurisdictions and saying, okay, here are the standards. What would it take to implement them? Looking at all kinds of things in terms of how this works for different settings and certainly also issues around cost. Uh, I have on the slide that 33 have applied, but uh, the last count is actually 37. Uh, and I'm not sure, but I suspect that it's not too late um, to apply to be one of those uh, sites if you'd like to. Um, we plan to have the report and the standards to the U.S. Attorney General by the end of this year. At that point, the Attorney General has one year before he issues the final rule or the final standards. And so while we make those recommendations, ultimately the Attorney General of the United States is the one who promulgates the standards or the rules that will apply across all settings. Uh, finally, not finally, but just issues in ter to, to flag that certainly we've seen through the standards process is what things are good in terms of prevention, right? Uh, investigations has been um, a big issue for many. Uh, victim services uh, and data collection. Certainly the data collection that BJS does, but collecting data in order to comply with your sort of yearly uh, mandate to uh, participate in the BJS survey, but also using data in a preventative way to sort of figure out where are the hot spots and to take action uh, to remedy um, that, those vulnerabilities. Uh, and finally, sanctions. Um, I've heard many corrections people talk about uh, the fact that there are bad actors or a few staff who uh, step across the line, but it's very difficult to sanction them. Often staff resign, and if they resign, there's really often no way for another jurisdiction to know what they did or what somebody thought they did in another jurisdiction. And certainly there have been huge issues around the prosecution of these cases. And those are all kinds of things that the Commission is going to be looking at. Um, I've also just flagged uh, some of the legal issues. And I'm certainly willing to talk about those at greater length during the Q&A period. I know many people are concerned about agency and staff liability, and I'm more than willing to address that. Um, there are also issues around sex offender registration. Uh, and also, there have been um, um, suggestions, certainly from some of the people who have testified at our hearings, that there should be some sort of way to have uh, a system uh, where you are able to have information on staff who have been fired uh, because of substantiated claims of uh, sexual violence. Uh, and I think that's a very controversial proposal, but it's certainly out there. Also, what impact does this have on the Prison Litigation Reform Act? And also, what are the human resources issues in terms of firing? Uh, again, I'm putting out some very provocative issues there, and I'm hoping that I hear from you guys in the Q&A period. And finally, I just wanted to end about where to go for resources. Uh, I'm naming names here. Uh, so you see uh, Dee Holly from um, NIC. Uh, you certainly have a website uh, for the work that I do here at American University. I'm naming the Moss Group, which is also one of the um, uh, uh, grantees uh, with uh, the National Institute of Corrections, Julius Dupree from the Bureau of Justice Assistance, Andy Goldberg, and certainly Stop Prisoner Rape is a very uh, important resource. And so I guess, uh, AP, I'd like to end right there. Brenda, thank you. I can say that uh, you have raised a number of fascinating questions. And indeed, we have an embarrassment of riches. There are a large million questions. There are a lot of questions coming in. And as a, as a panel, we have uh, an obligation to uh, 
give people the information that they're seeking. So in that spirit, Barbara, I'm going to turn it over to you and ask you to provide your introduction so that we can then move to the questions that people have and, uh, and get them answered. Thank you, Director Wall. Um, m my comments are going to be a, a, about a much smaller piece of the PREA puzzle. My approach is somewhat um, different but complementary to both uh, Dr. Beck and Professor Smith as they outlined it. Um, I'm going to talk about, in a very general way, about the context of sexual violence for both women and girls. Um, you can see that I have 40 slides and nobody needs to shudder and think I'm going to go through all of them. I'm going to go through the first seven and if there's questions we'll re refer to uh, the, the further information. But my work really centers on developing both qualitative and quantitative measures of sexual violence in women's institutions. I, I mention girls because I think it's very important to remember, as Alan uh, so nicely pointed out, that PREA also covers juveniles. And I know that Alan and his ABLE team are, are getting ready to um, start measuring the experience of juveniles. The, the material I'm going to cover looks at what I call the pathways to crime for both adult and juvenile um, female offenders, both the work that I've done with my colleagues James Wells, Joy Pollock, and Bernadette Muscat, really indicates that prior incarceration experience shapes the, the context of sexual violence for women and girls. And I would guess that's true for the men and, and boys, too. Um, this, this notion of pathways really examines the kinds of gender-based experience that women and girls have had prior to their incarceration. The, the next um, major idea is the critical role of context in sexual assault. Uh, the BJS data provides us our first ever measure of national prevalence and incidence. But as Alan pointed out in his um, commentary, the next step is um, unpacking these numbers, looking um, at the social climate, for example, looking at um, other kinds of measures. He, he particularly uh, talked about sexual activity with staff in terms of willing and unwilling. And our data that we've collected looks at that very, very um, spe specifically. Um, I also have information on a lot of the current research done looking at uh, female adult facilities. Some of this research has been done um, by the Moss Group through NIC funding. Some very interesting um, work by Nancy Wolf and her colleagues in New Jersey. Of course, um, the BJS NIS findings. And then I'm prepared to talk about some of our, our preliminary findings. And if you could go to slide three, Jim. Um, one of the things that, um, and that's slide two, uh, if you look at slide three, you can see that there's some questions which, which underpin our work. And, and that's the larger question of vulnerability that both Alan and Brenda talked about. The question is, what makes sexual violence possible? in a specific facility. In other words, what is the context of vulnerability? I also think that the flip side of that question is exploring the possibilities for a safer correctional environment for women and girls. If we know about the vulnerabilities, again, in this contextual way, including, of course, individual factors, which are part of the context, but also stepping back and looking at some of the um, other issues, I think we have to ask that question. How can we make these places safer for women and girls? When we talk about females specifically, we always come to the question, what do we do about consensual relationships? Um, consensual relationships between inmates was picked up certainly in the BJS NIS data. And you see um, the, the details on willing and unwilling. You also see the issue of pressure. I was particularly fascinated by the fact that um, there were high rates of pressure uh, noted by the BJS NIS work. And, I, and that's something we've certainly picked up in, in our interviews with women in, in four states and in both prisons and girls. 
just, uh, I mean, this, this idea of um, searching has also been a, a major theme that's developed in our qualitative data. And we, we, I, I tend to call it over-searching. How much of this over-searching is really reflected in the data that Alan and his uh, team have, have collected? Um, I think the, the last question here is, is one, as, as Brenda likes to say, is controversial. And that is um, avoid punishing relational behavior. Work that I've done, work that many other uh, criminologists and sociologists of women's prisons have pointed out is that women do their time in this relational context. And, and I've seen in many states that I've looked at that one of the first reactions under the PREA umbrella is to punish um, relational behavior. And, and I think that um, even though this is uh, kind of a wild thing to say, I think we have to think very carefully about PREA being used as another way to, to further punish um, women and girls. And, and again, for, for uh, men and boys and, and young men uh, for, as that matter. So I think these are the overall questions that, that underpin the, the work that we're doing in four states. And if we move to slide number four, you can see an overview of some of the implications for the pathways um, that, that uh, prior experience has for sexual violence in, in female facilities. Overall, a large majority of women and girls in uh, facilities have um, inappropriate sexualization. And if you see with that, I, I bring that up in the first uh, bullet point. That could mean sexual violence. It could mean being sexualized at a young age. It could be a very common pairing of introduction to sexual behavior and drug or alcohol behavior at the same time. You also see in the lives of many girls and young women that sex itself has been defined as love or as a commodity, something that they can sell both um, in their lives before prison and sometimes even in their lives in prison. The, the kind of psychological notion of boundary issues is really critical when you look at the relationships women have in prison, both with each other and with staff. Uh, the, the fourth issue has to do with defining domestic violence. We've certainly found a lot of what would be called domestic violence in a community setting within the prison. And this, this notion of definition, I think, is, is a critical part of the context that we need to develop. Um, women report to us in our studies and many, many other studies, studies enormous fears about disclosure and reporting. And that was one of the enormous strengths of the BJS approach in uh, protecting the confidentiality of, of these reports, which isn't always true in, in official reports and investigations. We also know that the, the idea of PTSD's attendant uh, symptoms such as depression um, and re-traumatization also account for some of the sexual behavior we see in women's prisons. I think uh, raising questions about uh, sexual violence in women's facilities really uh, brings up a treatment issue in, in, in two levels the notion of the immediate crisis when there is an assault, and then long-term treatment issues. Finally, um, one of the things we do know in setting women and girls in locked up facilities is that trauma is an untreated condition, and this trauma um, creates a lot of the relational violence we see in these facilities, as well as a lot of the survival behaviors you see post-release. Post so this is just a, a, a detail about the pathways that women and girls travel before they come to prison and show how these experiences before prison really have a, a, a definite influence on their sexual and relational behaviors once they, they do come to our facilities. Um, the next slide, slide number five, talks about context. And, I, and I'm defining context very quickly here, trying um, to keep to my uh, seven slides, even though I could talk forever. First of all, I, I've talked about some of the individual factors, past abuse, the kind of relationships women form while they're inside. But equally important are the definitions of self and their situation. In our interviews in uh, prisons and jails and four specific states, 
we've found that women very often define themselves in terms of their sexual relationships in prison, and we find that they define their situation in, in ways that, quite frankly, were, were surprising to me. A, a second element of context has to do with the physical and environmental factors. Physical plant staffing are, are just two uh, other examples of, uh, of these elements. The, the third um, level of context, or the third aspect of this notion, is what um, I see as organizational factors. Looking at staff culture, looking at inmate culture, um, really shape the, these behaviors. Uh, the work on staff organizational factors is, is represented in the work that the Moss Group did for the National Institute of Corrections. Um, we have several uh, bulletins that are available on the NIC website, and I do believe that um, they've, they've been posted in the resource section of this um, uh, webinar. Uh, inmate culture, of course, has an enormous influence on how women and girls define their relationships with other women as well as de define their behaviors. And I think this leads us to the last important kind of unifying element of context, and that is definitions. There's official definitions of this behavior. There's operational definitions, as the BJS studies and many other studies have developed. And then there's the personal or the individual definitions of, of sexual relationships and sexual violence. So taken together, these four issues, individual factors, physical and environmental, organizational factors, and finally definitional factors shape the context of gendered violence for, for women and girls in correctional facilities. Uh, uh, there's always a downside to being the last presenter, and it's that uh, we have questioners now champing at the bit, uh, wanting to, uh, to hear additional information. And so I'm going to ask you if you can wrap uh, your presentation up in the next 60 seconds or so so that we can answer the public. A absolutely. Um, I think if you skip to slide number seven, my last slide, you'll see that I I've outlined some of the important uh, work about women and, and girls, primarily adult women, in um, this field. So as we um, field the questions, maybe folks will ask some particular questions about uh, girls in this setting, and I look forward to hearing the questions. Uh, Barbara, thank you so much. Now it's time to uh, toss some questions to the panelists that have been raised by folks who are out there participating in the conference. Uh, by the way, speaking for myself, I always talk longer than I think I have. I look at my watch. After I give a, uh, an answer or a presentation, I say, did I really take up that much time? So uh, with that in mind, please, uh, panelists, uh, if I pause you during the course of a response, uh, take no offense. I'm just trying to make sure that we answer as many questions as we can. And to those of you who have posed questions, uh, there are so many of them, and they're so good, that my difficult job as moderator is to pick and choose among them. So please bear with me if uh, not all of the questions get answered. That having been said, uh, Alan, I think I'd like to uh, ask you to address this one. Um, somebody has asked about the top 10. Uh, and the question is whether you see any common characteristics that would explain why those top 10 prisons might be at the top of the list. Uh, Alan, are you with us? Hi, AT. This is uh, Jim Coney. Um, I'm going to chat with uh, Alan and see if we can get him back online. In the meantime, maybe we can just toss the question to uh, one of the other panelists. All right, sure. What we'll do is, uh, since that question is specific to Alan's survey, we're going to hold that one and see if Alan is available to answer it. Uh, at a later point, uh, but here's a question that I think is foundational, and uh, it also was the very first question asked in this uh, conference, and it is this. Do you have a good departmental policy uh, for corrections that we can use to compare to our policies? 
I think the question is well considered since policy is the foundation for so much of what we need to do to address this issue. Uh, Brenda, you've given a lot of thought and participated in the review of a, of a number of policies in the field. Uh, can you speak to the idea of a good departmental policy? I, I, I guess you're right. That is a great question. And what I would say is no policy is one size fits all. There, policy, just like whatever law you're able to get passed, really depends on what often is what is politically possible. Uh, even though more often than not there are greater possibilities with policy than there are with law. If you are looking for not the gold standard, but some examples of policies that you might uh, find, you could certainly go to um, the, the website uh, www.wcl.american.nic www.wcl.american.edu backslash NIC, the one that I put on my resource slide, and look at policies and procedures. And there are a number of policies and procedures that are posted there. Not that we necessarily vouch for them. There are also a number of policy guides that have done, been done by um, Susan McCampbell um, uh, with Center for Innovative Public Policy. And a number of these policies are also available through the NIC uh, website and also through the NIC Information Center. Thank you very much, Brenda. In the course of your remarks, uh, Barbara, you posed some issues that have raised, I think, some questions that go to the core of how we address the concerns raised in the course of the PREA legisla legislation. Uh, you talked about uh, issues of consent. You talked about uh, relational versus uh, abusive uh, contacts. And it stimulated this question from one of the folks participating. Um, so how do we differentiate between normal relational intimacy between female inmates and abusive behavior? Let me interject, by the way, that this question, of course, assumes that the context is inmate on inmate uh, sexual conduct, contact. I think it's understood by all that uh, when it comes to staff sexual misconduct, the responsibility is on the staff member. Consent of the inmate is beside the point. It is not the issue. But when you're talking about inmate on inmate relationships, the points that you made, Barbara, become highly relevant. But with that in mind, any thoughts about uh, how somebody who is charged with investigating this kind of behavior differentiates? I, I think that is a, a critical question that, that folks in charge of investigation, folks in charge of running a safe facility ask. And, and at this point, I, I don't have an answer. Um, we're analyzing our data, and you know researchers, we always take forever to analyze our data. Just real quickly, I see a question about when this will be published. We'll be submitting our findings and our recommendations to um, NIJ at the end of the summer. I suspect they, will, they won't be available for some time after that. But part of our project is to create operational bulletins that apply our research to various, various operational issues. And one of those it certainly is the how, how do you tell the difference and what do you do about it. I think that, that again, part of the contextual approach requires us to take a step back and ask questions about what kind of prevention, what kind of treatment can we offer to the, the population in general that, that, that looks at um, relationships that are harmful, that looks at relationships that might both get you in trouble in, in prison and sustain some of the problems that you, you have when you, when you leave the correctional environment. And so, well, um, A.T., I'm not answering the question specifically, how do you tell the difference? I don't know how to tell the difference. And what's been fascinating about our research is many women in these relationships don't know how to tell the difference either. And so I, I think that the question is, it should be now, what can we do to better equip um, women and girls while we have them in the facility to recognize what a, what a healthy relationship is, to recognize what their boundaries are, 
And again, I'm just absolutely fascinated by how our work overlaps with, with um, the BJS findings in terms of the high rates of pressure, of recognizing what pressure is. So I, I think that the, one of the first things is to think about educating inmates about sexual and personal safety in both the larger um, frame of providing treatment for women for, the, for um, their pathways to prison, but also in, in creating safety. But this really is the million dollar question and, and I don't know that um, I have the answer for it at this time. Thank you, Barbara. Speaking of which... Uh, hey, I'm sorry, this is Jim Cody interrupting. Uh, I think we hopefully have Alan back, back on the phone. I just wanted to test. Alan, are you there? I'm here. All right. Sorry we lost you. I don't know what happened there, but we're, uh, we're back. We're complete again. So proceed. One, uh, we have questions, and uh, we're hoping to ask you to provide answers. But first, a follow-up question for Brenda on this mm -hmm. same subject. Brenda, many of us out in the field are struggling with the question of how, if we're charged with investigating these kinds of incidents, we are to determine where consent plays a role and where it does not. And I think many of us are looking to the Commission to help us figure that out. Uh, any thoughts that you have from your extensive work in this area uh, about how investigators can consider the issue of consent? Well, I, I guess one of the things that where one of the places where I would start is just saying that sexual behavior in institutional settings is not static. I mean, if you think about, uh, if you can visualize sort of a line, right, with uh, forced sex on one end, and then moving over coerced sex, then strategic sex, and then consent, and around consent, particularly in an institutional setting, I put a question mark. And the reality is, and that's very difficult, is that relationships can go back and forth across that line. What may have started out as forced sex may end up becoming strategic because somebody says, okay, if I'm going to be forced into this, at least I better get something out of it, right? And then certainly the issue around consent is very difficult. I think that realistically what happens is that agencies must look at their policies. They must also uh, be very skill skillful in um, interviewing in inmates and looking at indicia of whether it looks consensual or not. You know, the reality is, is that for all institutions, I, I, I know very few that have a policy that says that sex of any kind is prohibited, is, is permitted. So, I mean, if you start with that, the issue then become, becomes what is the sanction? Is there going to be an administrative sanction or are you going to move this up into something that gets sent out to the state police or gets referred for prosecution? And I think that you look at indicia around um, uh, injury to the extent that there's any, um, trying to get in indicia around people feel whether they're forced, do they feel like they're able to um, leave or enter the relationship, certainly. This goes to sanction. It doesn't really go to permissibility or impermissibility. And certainly uh, when I talk about sanction, I think that currently the sanctions that we have are, you know, a disciplinary uh, prosecution. Uh, I suspect that there's some informal counseling that goes on. But I would argue that, uh, and, and agree with Barbara, that not only in women's institutions, but in men's institutions, there really need to be some much more um, clear attention to talking about relationships and also talking about boundaries uh, and, and, and also talking about sort of the risks, um, the, the challenges of having that kind of relationship, of, uh, that kind of relationship either with a staff member or an inmate. And I guess I'm, the last thing that I'm going to say, A.T., because I, I want, because we have loads of questions, is one of the things that no, nobody on this conversation, on this call has talked about, is the very serious public health issues that are raised by um, the sexual behavior in institutional settings. Some of the most important research, I wouldn't say important, but some of the most, some of the more interesting research has been around uh, HIV infection 
and uh, also other sexually transmitted diseases. So there's a very serious public health issue here as well. And, and uh, this is Barbara Owen, and Brenda, I think that points out to the need for more education and more Absolutely. programs for inmates. Thank you very much. And Alan, uh, while you were uh, unavailable, some questions came in about the uh, about the results of the survey, and uh, one that's been repeated several times is, does your study reveal anything about the characteristics of the institutions which were rated as uh, in the top ten? Are there any is there anything that they seem to have in common that might explain why they ended up at the top of the list? Well, at this point, uh, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, we are investigating uh, exactly that question by uh, linking information that we get internal to the uh, questionnaire itself about the, uh, the circumstances within the prison, for instance, related to other violent victimization that may go on, whether the inmates have been in fights and hurt in fights and, and so forth, insofar as as general disruption in the facility co-varies with sexual violence, uh, we might uh, isolate uh, circumstances related to these uh, facilities. We're also tying information from uh, a census of facilities that we conducted in 2005 to look at characteristics of staff, characteristics of the facilities, look at crowding. You know, ultimately, if you house violent inmates, you're likely going to have more violence than if you house uh, less serious inmates. So there are all kinds of questions there that can uh, bring to, that, that can explain uh, some of the uh, co-variation in prevalence rates across the country. Let me also say we are also assessing the accuracy of these rates, and I think you have to put these rates uh, under a fine microscope to ensure that these rates are are in fact the case. And so we're looking, doing special runs to try to understand the nature of these allegations in these high-rate facilities. Thank you, Alan. In looking at the results of surveys that are being um, broadcast to our listeners, it's clear that by a large margin, an area that uh, those participating would really like to see addressed is that of prevention. What the, certainly the best solution is to keep these incidents from happening in the first place. And I have some thoughts about it. Uh, so why don't I throw my two cents worth in and then love to open it up to the other panelists, too. I think that when it comes to prevention, the, in addition to having sound policy and, uh, and good investigations, we need to get staff buy-in. The staff who work in our institutions need to know why this issue matters. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, it is a question of security, uh, which is fundamental to everything that we do in corrections. The fact is that uh, boundary violations uh, are one of the most extreme examples of the breakdown in the distance between professional staff, staff professionalism, and inmates. And in my experience, uh, in the area of both staff sexual misconduct and inmate-on-inmate inmate sexual abuse, I have never seen cases which weren't always accompanied by serious security concerns. Um, in the staff context, being off post, bringing in contraband, favoritism, uh, numerous examples of that nature. In the inmate-on-inmate inmate context, the violence that's associated with it. People will fight and even kill not to be victimized. People will fight over potential victims. Property changes hands. These are all security issues. They go beyond the question of sex and beyond the question of gender, and they are fundamental to everything that we do. For my money, getting staff to understand that this is an issue which is core to our mission of security is an important way to begin the work of prevention. Having said that, I'd love to hear if uh, Brenda, Barbara, Alan, you'd like to say anything. I, I think it's clear that th these things are interrelated. And Alan um, mentioned earlier uh, some uh, consideration of doing work on social climate or institutional climate. And it certainly worked. The Bureau of Prisons has 
pioneered and in many other states uh, use that approach too. And, uh, and I think everyone realizes that these things, to use my favorite word again, uh, occur in this uh, context, in this constellation. And, and while our information about the specifics or the incidents are both complying with the act and an important part of, of uh, preventing it, I think everybody recognizes there's many other things that, that need to be measured and addressed in, in order to improve sexual safety in our facilities. Um, AT, I, AT, I would add uh, two elements of sunshine. Uh, one is transparency in terms of uh, bringing in other people into uh, corrections who um, can talk about trauma, who can talk about victimization. I think that some of the most useful collaborations have been where uh, organizations that have a victim services or public health orientation have been brought in to provide education. And that would be the other, I guess, basically form of sunshine, which is lots of education um, for both inmates and staff. Uh, try to figure out all kinds of entries to talk about this information, talk about it in orientation, talk about it in roll call training. Let the manage, make it clear that management and leadership are very concerned uh, uh, about this and that it's important to you. Talk about it as a public health issue. Talk about it uh, as a security issue. And certainly one of the other things that you can't get around, um, and, and which is very simple, around uh, prevention is sight and sound supervision uh, and also uh, the use of technology um, that uh, can let you, you know, that can get to places where you can't get to. And I guess the other one would be an audit. Right now we have lots of information, most agencies have lots of information about where their contraband is, where their assaults take place. I mean, that's important information to know because you know, there are other things that are happening there between, other than uh, physical assaults and the contraband. So those are the things that I would offer. Sounds right on the money to me. And while we have you, Brenda, I will point out that a number of the individuals participating have astutely pointed out that in their jurisdictions there are statutes that govern the criminalization of staff sexual misconduct. Your work actually has, uh, has been uh, instrumental in tracking and promoting the enactment of statutes that criminalize staff sexual misconduct. Perhaps you can give a brief overview of that. Okay, great. I actually gave Jim uh, a couple of slides uh, that had uh, some maps. And uh, maybe what he'll do is, um, is uh, show some of them. But um, when we started doing work in this area, I'd say in the early 90s, there were a significant number uh, of states uh, that did not have laws which specifically prohibited uh, staff from having sex uh, with inmates in custody. One of the things that I'm really happy uh, to say now is that every state now has a law that prohibits the sexual abuse of um, that prohibits the sexual abuse of uh, inmates in custody. And I see that Jim has pulled up uh, has pulled up the map. Thanks, Jim. Um, Brenda, and, when you say prohibits, uh, could you define that further? What do you mean by prohibits in this context? Well, what I mean is that if you have sex with somebody in custody, you face, uh, in most places, uh, a felony conviction. Okay? Um, and it prohibits anything from the things that we generally think about in terms of uh, sexual penetration. Uh, in many states, it also prohibits sexual touching. There are also several uh, states, and I think uh, the two that I'd mentioned would be Florida and I believe Missouri, that actually have specific provisions in their law, in their staff sexual misconduct laws, that prohibit, um, that actually sanction failure to report, getting to some of those code of silence uh, issues. Uh, one of the other, I think, um, 
areas to talk about in terms of the development of the law. And again, this can be a very useful tool because, as you know, some people respond actually by knowing that behavior that they're thinking about engaging in is illegal. And so that would be a good preventative piece. Um, every that would state, get people's attention. Yes. Every state except Nevada and Delaware um, uh, um, have laws that specifically uh, prohibit the conduct. And I only mentioned Nevada and Delaware. They have laws, but they have sort of a quirky uh, uh, law. They have quirky laws which also uh, punish inmates for having sex with staff. Mm -hmm. that's, that, but that's very much the exception from what you're saying. That's very, very much the exception. And in fact, Arizona uh, was among, uh, was with um, Nevada and Delaware in punishing uh, inmates as well. And they have recently changed their law because they found that um, it was very difficult to get inmates to report the sexual abuse because they feared that they would face another criminal charge because they would be um, accused of having uh, been involved in consensual sex. Well, thank you for that overview, Brenda. A number of our participants represent juvenile corrections. And they have questions, too. And the threshold question is really one for you, Alan, which is uh, what work have you done in the area of juvenile corrections? Well, uh, we have uh, done a fair amount of work. Uh, we did an initial survey in 2004 to get some baseline uh, numbers related to juvenile corrections. And let me say we found rates that are substantially higher than the rates we observed in adult corrections. Uh, obviously, uh, issues related to, uh, to uh, sexual conduct within juvenile facilities is quite different. Those, th those issues are, are quite different than adults, and, and fundamentally because they are kids. And there are, there are many issues related to mandated uh, reporting of abuse and neglect by staff. And as a consequence, we actually may see higher rates resulting from simply those those rules related to to that and mandated reporting. But those rates were substantially higher. Since then, we've been conducting administrative records collections, and we did one in 05 and one in 06. We are about to uh, issue a report based on, on those, uh, those surveys that uh, uh, combine 05 and 06 together to get much more stable information. The number of incidents, thankfully, are relatively low. And so uh, we need to um, put together those two surveys in order to get stable, stable estimates. At the same time, we've developed our methodologies for a CASI, that is the Audio Computer Assisted Self-Interviewing. And we yeah. have what that is, Alan, because some of the questions have been, what do you mean by audio CASI? I'm interrupting only so you can share sure. before you continue. The, that, that methodology is uh, a methodology that involves actually uh, going to youth. That is, we sample facilities, and then once in those facilities, we uh, sample in, uh, youth, and we sit down and we conduct an interview with, with those youth. And so uh, we are about to begin the national collection, the national implementation uh, of youth across the country, that is, those audio computer assisted self interviews. We're, uh, we're at this point looking for OMB the uh, approval, the Office of Management and Budget must approve our work. We have conducted some pretests in facilities selected on an ad hoc basis. We have found rates of sexual contact that involve coercion that are substantially higher than that what, that what we observe you know, among adults. Uh, we uh, know that some of these youth are prone to uh, misreporting. We've looked at that, and we've found in our, in our work rates that are somewhere around uh, 4 to 7%, uh, depending on how you, how you measure it. So the uh, incident, the prevalence rates in youth facilities are very much an issue. We will begin that uh, data collection uh, in state-operated uh, facilities all across the country, in, uh, beginning uh, once we have OMB approval. We expect that to occur in April. Thank you very much. It sounds as if uh, juvenile corrections is getting attention from BJS, and uh, we'll get the similar similar kinds of uh, surveys as have been done in the adult system. That's correct. Brenda, 
is the commission working specifically in the area of juvenile corrections as it promulgates standards? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, will they be a separate section? Yes. I'm, 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 I'm trying to be a little bit more uh, a little bit more brief, but absolutely. The um, I appreciate that, and I'm not, I, I'm not suggesting you need to elaborate. I just wanted to give you time if you if you so chose. No, uh, the, the reality is is that um, as we we certainly are going to be coming out um, by the end of April with the adult standards. It may take a little bit uh, longer for uh, juvenile and for community corrections settings, but there definitely will be standards uh, for juveniles. Well, that, that's helpful. You had mentioned earlier that uh, in this area, one size fits all doesn't necessarily apply, and it sounds as if what you're telling us is the commission is going to be adopting standards specific to the context, adult corrections, institutional, juvenile corrections, community corrections. It won't just be one set of standards with general application. Right. And, and, and certainly there will be differences between prisons and jails as well. Speaking of jails, uh, we have a question from a jail commander that I think articulates what's on the minds of many of our staff who work in custodial settings. And he is expressing concern that uh, Priya will, will encourage current inmates or ex-inmates to make false allegations against staff, ruining reputations and uh, increasing liability. Who would like to address that, uh, that very real concern on the part of people in the field? Well, uh, let, let me begin on that, uh, since I uh, obviously am very concerned about uh, that in terms of getting into facilities, ensuring that the numbers are uh, accurate. Uh, Obviously, uh, you know, some inmates are there because they're not entirely truthful, because they do have uh, a, a history of deceit. We uh, obviously cannot, in our measurement, uh, uh, raise the level of a full investigation. We do know that uh, allegations reported to correctional authorities, and upon investigation, many of them proved to be untrue, many being about one in four. The other, uh, about uh, about one in four, proved to be true, that, are, that the evidence is there and sufficient to merit it. And about half the evidence is insufficient to determine whether it occurred or not. And so when we do these uh, measures of staff sexual misconduct in particular, we, we have to interpret these measures uh, with that in mind. Uh, however, we do know that there's a great deal of variation from facility to facility, and so some facilities are, going to, are coming up with higher rates of staff sexual misconduct than other facilities. And so I think the, the logical question is, is, why are those facilities turning up those higher rates and other facilities are not? And, and there, I think, you then need to pursue the, the specifics of what is being alleged, to look at the gender of staff, to look at the circumstances surrounding uh, those uh, incidents that are being reported, to assess those, assess those in, uh, incidents. I think we know that uh, in terms of uh, false reporting, that the staff sexual misconduct data are, 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 are the most vulnerable. However, I, I look at these data and I find a great deal of credibility uh, and, uh, and uh, stability in these numbers. So I pose the question that if facility comes out high, uh, the, uh, the, uh, it's hard to uh, imagine why those things are high uh, just simply because inmates in one facility are untruthful and other facilities, they're honest. Mm -hmm. Barbara, you've done a lot of work on the dynamics of uh of staff and inmate interactions, we all know that this concern of staff is something that is very real and important to them. Uh, what would you say to staff who are worried that PREA is going to empower inmates to set up staff? As everybody's noted, the, the, the issue of false allegations is, is something that comes up in, in conversations, and interestingly enough, in conversations with, uh, with inmates, too. Inmates talk about their concern with uh, other, in this case, women making false allegations. So it's not only a staff concern. I, I think the, the initial answers are the same answers that, that Brenda offered for uh, at another question. 
to another question, and that is having a firm policy, having a sound investigative procedure, and training your staff in, in terms of not only these two things, the policy, the investigation, the reporting procedures, but also training your staff in what an appropriate relationship is with an inmate. And, and, and in, in our interviews with staff working with females in, in prisons and jails through the NIC-funded MOSS group work, which is available on the resource page, you see that, that staff are very thoughtful about false allegations. While there is a concern that, oh, this is just going to be another way for inmates to get over, another way for inmates to manipulate us, that isn't, isn't the common uh, point of view. Staff see that um, false allegations, again, arise in a context. And maybe the staff um, person might not be involved in sexual misconduct, but may be involved in some other kind of misconduct with inmates. So it, it's my view that both staff and inmates don't think the false allegations come out of a clear blue sky primarily. They, they, they come for some other kinds of, of staff misconduct that may or may not be sexual. I think yes. the point that you and Brenda make about the quality of the investigation is essential. I know from our experience here that a great deal of the credibility lies in the detail and quality of the investigative process. And our investigators need to be well trained on the, the dynamics and on how to interview people who come forward with allegations of this nature. And those questions need to be very detailed. And, uh, and, and a AP, let, let me just add that the investigations need to be through the lens of a sexual assault investigation. And I think it's it's a new day for corrections in, in recognizing that investigations have to have this service or this treatment or, if I dare say, this empathy component. And, and I see that uh, on the screen uh, the NIC bulletin and staff perspectives uh, pointing to investigation makes this, this point in more detail than I can right now. Yeah. And I guess one of the things, AP, that I would say just very briefly on the fa false allegations point is that there are tremendous hurdles in institutional settings to reporting, you know? I mean, you've got to get the form. You've got to find somebody to take the form. Um, you know, the form um, has to be processed. The form has to be processed. It has to be done in a particular period of time. Um, you know, people out there uh, probably have their own uh, ideas of the, if you think about uh, inmate grievances, the number of which are, are upheld. So there's significant hurdles to even making a uh, complaint. And I think uh, certainly as anybody who's, you know, worked in an institution, and certainly as the literature recognizes, there are significant um, perceived, there's significant and I think well-founded fears about retaliation from uh, staff and really from other inmates as well. So um, while false allegations I think are certainly uh, an issue that we can discuss, um, the, the reality is, is there's so many institutional and other barriers to just making a complaint that I don't think that false allegations is really are um, that significant an issue. Thank you. There are a number of questioners who I think have quite astutely recognized that there are different categories of inmates that may present special issues. And one that has arisen in a number of questions is uh, the situation of gay and transgender inmates mm -hmm. and whether as a special population there are particular sort of management issues that ought to be considered as we're looking at ways to prevent uh, sexual violence. And prevention, once again, seems to be the, uh, the dominant interest of the people participating in the conference. So first I'll start with you, Alan. Has there been any effort to try to do any statistical research which separates out that population? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, the fact of the matter is we are working on a report that will be issued on June 30th uh, for Congress that will examine some of those um, 
inmate risk factors, and obviously uh, one that comes through is uh, is sexual uh, identity and sexual preference, uh, uh, past uh, uh, sexual activity as as well is correlated with 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 risk. So uh, that uh, report, uh, when we finish it, I think will reveal some of the things that many are most interested in. Thank you, Brenda. You have done a lot of work in looking at the particular concerns that both uh, advocates for this population have and also uh, institutional managers who are trying to work appropriately with this population in the area of sexual violence consider. What, what are your thoughts? I guess what I would say, um, Alan, is not Alan, I'm sorry, AT. I guess AT, what I'd say is that um, prevention here is key, uh, having good systems in place uh, to identify risk, not only for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered um, individuals when they come in, but somebody actually talked about policies. There are actually uh, very good policies that are out there. Uh, I think there's some on the SPR website. Uh, the Sylvia Rivera Project has a great report uh, out uh, talking about the treatment of transgendered uh, individuals in custody. I think I have that right. And so uh, I think that there's a lot of thinking and a lot of writing that's been done uh, on this. Certainly supervision is key. And one of the um, real issues um, has been how do you um, deal with uh, people who, for example, have not quite transitioned? What, I mean, and there are other issues not only related to safety, but there are other issues related to medical care as well. And those are some of the same issues that put people as, at risk. I mean, do you have an obligation to continue to provide a hormone uh, for people who are transitioning? If you have somebody who has different genitalia, uh, than sort of what they identify as. I mean, these are very, um, I think, complex issues, and they're not something that you can kind of handle on the fly. Uh, if this is an, a, a concern, and I think that everybody who is in corrections has experienced it, it and, and they know about these particular vulnerabilities, this is one of the things that you might want to flag in terms of your implementation of PREA to go out and do some more research on and pull together a group of people, both internally and, and externally, and talk about what your policy is going to be. Um, and finally, I'd say that DC actually just uh, issued a very good policy about how police officers will deal with transgender individuals who they come into contact and what the uh, experience and what will happen to them when they go to the jail. My impression is that. Uh, it's, you're right, it's a very complicated issue for us in the field to, to deal with because we have so many different types of people that are living in close quarters. This service is provided by freeconferencecall.com. Please enter your conference access code, followed by the pound key. This menu will repeat. You entered 920160. If this is correct, press 1. To re-enter your access code, press 2. There are 61 other callers on the call. Conference options have now changed. At any time, press star 4 for conference instructions. Please announce yourself. The complexity of these kinds of things, I think, mirrors a lot of the arguments we make in the contextual approach. Right. And, and AT, one of the other things, I mean, you, you talked about um, transgendered individuals. There are other populations which can be, vi can be quite vulnerable. I mean, one um, that I feel sort of falls in a gap with a lot of the work that we're doing 
uh, is adults, not adults, youth who have been transferred for prosecution as adults. Uh, in many system, they're systems, they're housed in general population with other inmates. And they are tre tremendously vulnerable uh, to physical and sexual assault. And I guess one of the things that I'd put out, is, is I'd be interested in just in, in terms of a question, is, Alan, whether any of that has emerged or whether that's a particular population that BJS is going to be looking at. Well, let me say a few words about that. Fortunately, there aren't many kids in adult systems in, in prisons. The numbers have been dropping. Their latest estimate is around 2,500 in state and federal prisons, state prisons, uh, none in federal. And then in any one day in, a, in local jails, there are somewhere around six to 7,000. That number is lower as well since uh, in 10 years ago. So the numbers, still a lot. So the numbers, the numbers are, are declining. Uh, and so uh, that's a good sign. Uh, we, we did not interview kids uh, this first round in 2007. We will be interviewing kids in 2008. Uh, let me say that in a uh, sample like ours, even though we uh, have a very large sample, the uh, probability of actually selecting uh, an offender under the age of 18 is very, very low. We estimated that we, we, we missed only about 40 uh, kids in our sample uh, by excluding them from our prison sample in, in 2007. So the estimates of of risk, the, the, the prevalence rates uh, are very uncertain. Uh, there is there is a common belief that that uh, kids are more vulnerable than uh, others. Uh, we just simply don't have the uh, data to sustain that at this point. Okay. So that I, this, this is Barbara. I'd like to point out this discussion of vulnerable inmates has to go back to what Brenda offered in her commentary, and that is the dynamics of sexual activity and, and sexual violence. Because one of the things that I've seen in some states is when, um, for example, transgender males are, are put in one unit, there's violence among them. And so we have to remember the dynamic and the contextual nature rather than just focus on individual risk factors. It's, it's definitely a, a piece of the puzzle, but it's Which, not the only answer. Right, that does speak to staff training and, uh, and eternal vigilance because uh, you're right, one can't assume that uh, there's any category of inmate in which the possibility of being predatory doesn't exist. Barbara, you have uh, expertise in uh, health care and female inmates, and I'm going to ask you to generalize from that to answer a series of questions that have come in from people participating, specifically uh, in an allegation of sexual assault, be it staff sexual misconduct or inmate on inmate, uh, what is the appropriate response of health services? Many of our staff are, in fact, in the medical and mental health fields. What's the appropriate response when an allegation surfaces? It, it's been my experience that um, the teamwork approach is the most uh, effective response, and teams uh, that that make that are made up of investigators, mental health professionals, uh, physical uh, medical professionals, as as well as those involved with investigation and um, classification kinds of issues. So I think so often our investigators are left without the support uh, of folks with this expertise. So the short answer is a teamwork approach that, that includes um, th these various folks, in my view, is probably the best approach. It's, you pointed out that these, things, these cases need to be looked at uh, as sexual assault cases. So let me ask you, Brenda, does, um, what are the implications of that perspective for how we should mobilize resources Healthcare and mental health resources. Uh, I think that the uh, it, it goes back to my earlier point about sunshine. Uh, it, you really often corrections agencies don't have those kinds of resources in house. It's very important to have a good relationship uh, with your local hospital uh, that does um, uh, sexual assault examinations 
certainly uh, getting in contact with your SANE, which is Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner Organization or individual uh, in your jurisdiction would be good. And I think that it's very important to initiate a conversation with uh, your local um, rape crisis centers. Now, one of the things that I want to mention, uh, which, has, um, which is actually one of the hurdles that we heard about uh, during our last hearing in New Orleans, is that in many jurisdictions, uh, the funding that rape crisis or uh, victim services organizations, get, victim organizations get prohibits them from, pro from providing services uh, either to offenders or in, insti I think it's primarily for people in institutional settings, which is uh, a really significant problem, particularly when you're looking at trying to uh, collaborate with victim services organizations. Many, however, do have service funding from other sources and are very anxious to be partners. But I think that that's one of the big, my primary suggestion, which is to uh, look outside for some help and also to get some training for your staff inside. And some cross-training with these partners. Yes, absolutely. Private prisons, a number of our participants want to know, do they get a pass? Alan? No. Alan, tell us about uh, your work with private prisons. No, absolutely not. Uh, private prisons uh, are treated just as uh, like state or federally operated prisons, and so are uh, privately operated jails treated just like a uh, public, publicly operated jail. We have done some administrative data collection from private uh, prisons and jails, and the rates of allegations and the rates of uh, substantiated incidents are, are very, very similar to uh, the state and, and local public uh, facilities. We uh, also included uh, private facilities in our uh, in our actual victim surveys uh, in in the most recent wave of, of collection. We did not oversample; they just had the same probabilities of selection like any other facility. And my understanding, uh, Brenda, is that uh, from the point of view of legal liability, if a, if a jurisdiction contracts with a private prison, that doesn't get us off the hook. No. Is that right? No. 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 So we still, we can't contract away our obligation to, uh, to keep inmates safe from this kind of uh, behavior. No, you can't, but it does raise a really important um, sort of operational or leadership issue, which is to look very closely at the contracts that you have with private agencies to make sure they're congruent with your policies and procedures. Cross-gender supervision is coming up in a number of the comments and questions that we're getting. Uh, a debate about there is some belief, including on the part of some advocates, that the one solution to the issue of staff sexual misconduct is to eliminate cross-gender supervision, that uh, women staff shouldn't be supervising uh, male inmates and male staff shouldn't be supervising female inmates. Uh, any of you have any thoughts about that? Well, let me say that the data are certainly showing a significant involvement of female staff with uh, male inmates, particularly in, in prisons. We've been monitoring this through our administrative data collections, and we've, we're finding that about 60% of the uh, substantiated incidents of staff sexual misconduct involve female staff with, uh, with male inmates. But, but I also think, and I'm sure Brenda would say this too, is that we have to keep in mind staff sexual misconduct is not always a male-female dynamic. And, and Alan's administrative data supports this, experience supports this, that, that we have to be very careful not to narrowly define staff sexual um, misconduct as behavior between men and women. We know it occurs in all the quadrants. And so while cross-gender um, searching has to be thought about very carefully, we also have to remember that, that it, staff sexual misconduct must be defined less narrowly. Yeah, and I guess where I would come down, at, especially since I do a lot of writing in this area, is that, you know, and, and, and this is legally, um, agencies are, are on quite firm footing 
to uh, limit um, male supervision of female inmates. I mean, and I think that that's pretty consistently been ruled constitutional throughout the country. Um, at the same time, it's also been ruled constitutional that female staff can supervise male inmates in almost any setting except for one that involves prolonged viewing of them while they are nude. Uh, and I think that that's a problem. I don't think that um, uh, cross-gender supervision, uh, um, I don't think that it is the answer to all um, staff sexual misconduct, but I do believe that there are um, very serious issues around privacy and sort of um, the crossing of boundaries when you have staff of the opposite gender uh, viewing um, inmates uh, in, in positions where they are disrobed. I think that probably a better practice would be to have same gender supervision in settings where there's uh, exposure to nudity. I mean, that's, and I, I don't think that it's going to end all um, um, uh, staff sexual misconduct, but I think that it could uh, limit it, that it could reduce it. And we're trying to do whatever we can to prevent and reduce uh, sexual violence in custody. And Barbara's point is, I think, well taken that while Alan's data shows that uh, uh, there's a significant amount of staff sexual misconduct that uh, crosses the gender lines, uh, right. there is also uh, staff sexual misconduct that occurs in same-sex right. uh, supervision. In, in Rhode Island, we have had uh, cases involving male staff and female inmates female staff and female inmates, female staff and male inmates, and male staff and male inmates. We also, I think it uh, bears pointing out, have had uh, cases involving not only uniformed staff, but uh, health services, counselors, chaplains, uh, parole officers, and so forth. This is not an issue that is limited to correctional officers, uh, nor is it limited to line staff. Uh, it has over the years in Rhode Island, and I suspect in every jurisdiction, shown itself in a variety of, of contexts. Here's a question that, uh, that I think is important and very real. Um, Barbara, you did a lot of work, which I had a chance to read, about staff perspectives on sexual violence. And one of the, the themes here is how do we protect inmates who come forward to report sexual assault, and how do we protect staff who want to do the right thing by cooperating in an investigation? And one of the themes that came through in your work, as I recall, was this common thread in which both staff and inmates felt inhibited about reporting it because, in a sense, they were saying, I have to live here. Yes, and... and this is something that that I could go into some detail with with the with the slides, but I'm not, I'm not going to um, make uh, Jim find them. The issues in reporting captured all this range. Inmates' credibility in, in general is in question. Um, there's a fear of retribution for everybody. If I report this, what's going to happen to me? Um, staff in general talked about inmate manipulation. Um, there was a feeling that inmates will report on other sexual assault incidents, other staff sexual misconducts, but not their own. And staff talked quite a bit about the lack of trust that inmates have, not only in them, but in the process. Um, the, the second, uh, the slide number 11, I see Jim found them. Um, there, there's a difficulty in, in realizing credibility defined across a variety of measures. Particularly with women, there's a la often a lack of physical evidence, and that's particularly true when a, a period of time has elapsed between the reported assault and, and the beginning of the investigation. Uh, there's a big concern about inmates with mental health issues um, of often being deluded um, by these events. Or, or um, finally, there's the idea of that staff aren't sure that they should trust inmates, inmates aren't sure they should trust staff, 
And so I, I think that these issues go directly to not only staff culture issues, but also to the basic themes that have been developed during our conversation, the theme of training your staff, of having sound policies, of partnering and, and teaming in terms of your investigation, as well as educating inmates. Well, let's be practical. Uh, this would be true of both staff sexual misconduct and inmate on inmate sexual abuse. When an inmate comes to you or a staff member comes to you and says, in essence, if I were to tell you about what I saw or what happened, how would you protect me? What answer do we give them? What tools do we have? I think that the issue of protection is the flip side of retribution. And, and these are, are very real concerns of, of everybody involved. What's going to happen to me and is the response going to be more painful than the incident? I, I, again, I, I think I have to fall back on those beginning answers of policy, investigation, training, and, and having a, a, a PREA coordinator like many states have now that, that looks at how this question is going to be answered in this jurisdiction or in this agency. How is the issue of protection going to be handled? One of the things that we see very often that the inmate who reports these kinds of things is removed from his or her housing, loses their program status, maybe they're, they're visiting and, and put in some kind of segregation that ultimately is, is punitive. And so these are the kinds of things I think PREA coordinators and developers of PREA policy have to answer. How, within the constraints of our system, can we protect inmates who come forward? Thank you. Uh, Brenda, any thoughts about uh, protection, which can sometimes look like punishment? You know what, um, AP, I do have some thoughts about that, but I also wanted to kind of go back to this other thread that we had going on about um, uh, cross-gender supervision and sort of Allen's numbers about uh, women um, staff. And um, I just want to kind of throw that out and maybe we can come back to it. but. Um, you know, right now, 90 to 3 percent of the people in custody are male, right? And so if we assume heterosexuality, you know, for, it, it, as a dominant theme, then the 60 percent involving female staff, I wouldn't say it looks reasonable, but you, you can sort of see that. Proportional. Yep. Proportional. Thank you. Um, I also worry about uh, sort of an underlying thread of this is around who um, who's vulnerable uh, in an institutional setting, and often female staff feel very unprotected, and sometimes they feel as vulnerable to um, harassment or to being unsupported as female inmates. And so no comparison there, but certainly similar issues around vulnerability. And I wonder if that's not a factor that needs to be looked at, and certainly whether sometimes uh, that they are more often than not more recent entry, entry, have more recent entries into the professional ranks of corrections makes them more vulnerable to being terminated or fired or resigning or whatever. But anyway, that's what I wanted to put out. Now, going back to this whole question around retaliation, I think that Barbara's done um, ab around protection. I think that that is the the um, the issue um, for both staff and for offenders. Um, one of the cases that I actually like to talk about is a case out of um, Massachusetts called Barron versus Hickey, where uh, one of a, a staff member uh, reported. Um, you know, that the uh, correctional staff were playing cards with some inmates. Um, and he was subjected to uh, slash tires, people dropping cheese in front of him, calling him a rat, calling him a snitch. Uh, he eventually um, um, resigned and uh, sued um, the department um, about his, um, you know, really what he believed was abusive behavior. And ultimately, he recovered a judgment of $500,000. Uh, and so I think that the consequences 
for not dealing with this. That's not going to happen every time, but can be quite serious. And really, the, the issue is that code of silence that exists for both inmates and for staff. This question also touches on leadership. And as we begin to close out the conference, it's something that I think ought to be addressed. We have many, many people participating in this conference. Oh. And clearly, they are people who are invested in the issue, who care about it, oh. who want to be proactive. We haven't talked much about leadership. What is the role of both leaders, formal leadership, such as positions like mine, and informal leadership, which may be true of many of the people who are listening, whether whatever their title is, what's the role of leadership in meeting the challenge of Priya? Thoughts? A.T., I know that I just said something, but I think that, that leaders, informal or formal, right? And we know about formal leaders like you, but the informal leaders within uh, institutional settings have to be very clear that, you know, this is where we draw the line, that this is not permissible, that, you know, when we allow this to happen, whether it's inmate on inmate or staff on inmate, that what we are doing is we are failing in one of our basic responsibilities, which is to provide a safe and secure environment for individuals who are there. And that this, you know, that, that this is our job, and this is something that we are responsible for. Other thoughts? Uh, Alan or Barbara? No, I, I think I'm um, very pleased to see the uh, number of folks who, at, at all different levels, across all different jurisdictions, who are interested in this. And, and I think this is the, the lesson of Priya, Alan's numbers, research that many of us are doing really is the first step. The, the, the standards of the commission, I think, will provide some guidance. But ultimately, this really is a, the, the beginning of the conversation about improving sexual safety in our facilities. And let me say that I've been quite impressed by the response of the correctional leaders uh, to Priya. Uh, I feel this uh, directly in the sense of being able to get into facilities and actually do this work. And I know all across the country, uh, correctional administrators have opened the doors and let us in and, and trusted us, even though the stakes are very high and potential potential for litigation exists. I must say that uh, even among the uh, correctional administrators who hit the top ten list, there, is, there was a unanimous uh, a belief that these numbers should be taken seriously and that there is a great need to understand what's behind these numbers. So I have been uh, very impressed by how the field has stepped up to this. Thank you for that. And I will say that uh, before I toss the, the cyberspace microphone back to uh, Jim <laughs> to close out, that uh, I think that the the take home I have from this is first, uh, so many great ideas and questions, so little time. My apologies to those of you whose questions and comments were not addressed in this. I hope there's a way that we can pursue the conversation. But mostly I feel really encouraged and heartened by the amount of interest that's been expressed from all across the country, all different levels of organizations, all different perspectives in this issue. I'm proud of the corrections profession because I really do believe that when we are given tough assignments, uh, we take them on. And we take them seriously. And we're doing it again here. And I am confident that we are building the kind of knowledge base and the kind of commitment that's going to be necessary so that uh, we can say credibly to the public, we deplore this kind of behavior. Uh, we condemn it. Uh, and we are doing everything possible not only to intervene and to punish it, but to prevent it in the first place. And as your colleague, that feels very good to me. So thank you so much. And Jim, back to you. Thank you very much, A.T. And uh, on behalf of uh, the Kennedy School at Harvard, let me say thank you so much to our panel and uh, to you, A.T., for moderating. 
This, uh, I'm fairly certain this was the most sizable virtual audience we've ever had for one of these events in the over two years we've been doing them. And uh, a plethora of questions asked, and you guys got to a great number of them. We're absolutely delighted. And uh, let me also just say thanks to NIJ for co-sponsoring this with us, particularly Melissa Marmer and Andy Goldberg for their help in planning. What I'd like to do for everybody is to go back to my instructions about how to get to this chat room. There's still a lot of you uh, hanging around. And if uh, you're willing, we'd like you to convene in this text-based chat room so you can continue the discussion with uh, other audience members. And I'll be there to help you with technical questions, but it's quite user-friendly. And I'll show you how to get there. But basically, what you want to do is go to the Government Innovators Network website. That's at www.innovations.harvard.edu. And the home page looks a little something like this. And in the top right corner, you'll see a box that says, What's New? And underneath that, there's a link to Sexual Victimization in Prisons Post-Event Chat Room. You'll want to click on that link, and then simply type in your name, click Sign In, And uh, you'll be in the text-based chat room, and you can begin chatting immediately. Uh, there's also, um, you can share URL links and uh, upload files for other people to share. Feel free to exchange contact information with your colleagues. And um, I'm going to uh, leave those instructions up so that you guys have them. But once you're in the chat room, you do not need to keep live meeting open. You can close it out if you'd like. So uh, I hope to see some of you there. And uh, thanks again to everyone for making this event such a success. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you all. I think we are adjourned. All right. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. So, so Jim, do you have anything to say to us? <laughs>